Honorable Minister Shikli, Colonel Yoav Brunner, Commanding Officer of the Paratroopers 35th Brigade. Lieutenant Colonel Odette Zeman, the incoming commander of the 55th Paratrooper Reserve Brigade, also known as the Liberators of Jerusalem. Russell Robinson, Chief Executive Officer of Jewish National Fund USA, and his wife Marcy. Dr. Saul Isabram, President of the Jewish National Fund USA and co-chair of this wonderful mission, and his wife Lauren. Michelle Bernstein, co-chair of this Israel 75 mission with Saul. Chairman of the board of base, of the base Richard Corman and his wife Jean. And dear members of bereaved families, representatives of Jewish National Fund USA, guests of the base, guests of JNF partner Nefesh Benefesh, and their lone soldiers, lone soldiers from around the world, Jewish war veterans, and guests from near and far. We are gathered here on the eve of our National Memorial Day at Ammunition Hill, and I stand in awe before you. My name is Alon Wald, and forever I am the child of and from Ammunition Hill. Behind me and in front of you, we stare into what was once a combat zone, the site of the infamous battle of Ammunition Hill. Collectively, we know the facts, that it was a pivotal battle, a battle that paved the way for a unified Jerusalem, something that feels normal and natural to us today, but 56 years ago, a united Jerusalem was far from a normal idea. The battle we commemorate here today took place on the night of June 5, 1967. That was the night when brave Israeli soldiers charged forward, the night during which 36 warriors fell. Those young men became part of the 182 soldiers who fell in the campaign for Jerusalem, and those 182 soldiers became part of the 779 soldiers who fell during the Six-Day War. Here and throughout Israel, we memorialize those soldiers and their families, our soldiers, our families. Yet we also take this moment to commemorate the more than 24,000 lives that have been taken from us in countless wars, operations, and attacks. Tonight, we cherish their memory. We honor their sacrifice. And we stand in solidarity as one Israel, one united global Jewish community. We also honor their families, mothers and fathers, brothers and sisters, children who feel longing and pain, an overwhelming sense of sadness for conversations that never were, simchas that never happened, moments that were supposed to be. With us tonight to light the torch is Uriel Bachrach, born in Germany in 1926 at a moment of profound uncertainty and anxiety for the Jewish people and indeed the entire world. He made aliyah to British mandate Palestine as a child and was an early student of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. In 1947, on the eve of our independence with weapons and manpower in short supply, Uriel was a founding member of Chemed, the Israeli Science Corps led by Ephraim Katsir. As war loomed, Chemed served as a scientific brains of the army, developing homegrown weapons to support our soldiers and military on the battlefield. The bravery of those soldiers in those times would have been for nothing had Chemed done anything less than he did. Following the war, Uriel became a molecular biologist and professor at the Hebrew University. Uriel, please join us to light this torch, this torch that commemorates the sacrifice of so many, this torch that lights our way forward together. Join Uriel on stage will be Ella Breskal and Isabella Green, students from the Alexander Moss High School in Israel. Please welcome Lieutenant Colonel Sagan Aluf Menachem Schechter, brother of the late Lieutenant Ishai Schechter, who will recite the Yiz Corps.
יזכור עם ישראל את בניו ובנותיו הנאמנים והאמיצים חיילי צבא ההגנה לישראל וכל לוחמי המחתרות וחטיבות הלוחמים במערכות העם ואנשי קהילות הבית, המודיעין, הביטחון, המשטרה ושירות בתי הסוהר אשר חירפו נפשם במלחמה על תקומת ישראל וכל מי שנרצחו בארץ ומחוצה לה בידי מרצחים מארגוני הטרור יזכור ישראל ויתברך בזרעו ויאבל על זיו העלומים וחמדת הגבורה וקדושת הרצון ומסירות הנפש של הנספים, הנספים במערכה הכבדה יהיו חללי מערכות ישראל עטורי הניצחון חתומים בלב ישראל לדור דור. And now, please welcome Rabbi Joseph Wasserman, retired chief rabbi for the IDF's Infantry and Paratroopers Unit, to chant the El Maleh. Ein Male Rachamim Shochein Bameromim Ametze Menucha Nechona Al Kanefei השכינה במעלות קדושים טהורים וגיבורים כזוהר הרקיע מאירים ומזהירים לנשמות חללי מערכות ישראל שנפלו במלחמות ישראל בפעולות הגנה תגמול וביטחון בעת מילוי תפקידם ובעת שירותם ושחרפו נפשם למות על קדושת השם ובעזרת אלוהי מערכות ישראל הביאו לתקומת האומה והמדינה ולגולת הארץ ועיר האלוהים ולכל מי שנרצחו בארץ ומחוצה לה בידי המרצחים ארגוני הטרור בעבור שאנו מתפללים לעילוי נשמותיהם בגן עדן תהיה מנוחתם לכן בעל הרחמים יסתירם בסתר כנפף לעולמים וישרור, בשרור החיים את נשמותיהם אדוני ונחלתם וינוחו בשלום על משכבותם ויעמדו לגורלם 
Please be seated. Tonight, on this battlefield that now lies quiet, I represent and remember my own father, Rami Zichro Livracha, who fought and fell here. He gave his life 56 meters from the air-conditioned office I'm now privileged to work in. For me and our family, neither his loss nor what he achieved will ever be taken for granted. As a child growing up in the shadow of the Six-Day War, the battlefield we stand on tonight strangely became a playground, a place where I played hide and seek. Back then, the heavy burden we feel tonight hadn't yet been placed on my shoulders. In June 1967, I was only 10 months old. Yet in this perilous time, my father joined his brothers in arms to defend the only home we had and have. The void he left in our lives was never truly empty. It was filled with love and devotion by those who served by his side, men who became fixtures in my life and who kept my father's memory alive for our family. In those times, orphans of the Battle of Jerusalem, like myself, asked so many questions. Some were simple, others were more challenging. We struggled to process what happened while we yearned for life and peace. The questions are not all that different than those we all ask ourselves today. Questions about heroism, devotion, and sacrifice. Questions about fear and the nature and the necessity of war. Questions about war's unimaginable cost. Questions about those left behind children, children, spouses, and communities that will never be the same. These are questions that the IDF and our citizen soldiers must ask every day and have been asking for the last 75 years. The answers we received many years ago are not at all different from those we share today. These answers reflect who we are as a people, the core and the essence of our society, and what we aspire to be. Every Memorial Day, every Yom HaZikaron, we lovingly remind ourselves of those answers, and we share them with those who visit this battlefield and with you who are gathered here tonight. For many years, I've had the opportunity to lead groups and missions here on Ammunition Hill. These individuals came from across Israel and from all over the world. I've been blessed to share the history of the place and what made Israel victorious against all odds, despite the cost. And I've been blessed to bring my father's spirit and sacrifice to life, and his role in this victory. Yet I've, been s I've always spoken about him, not to him. It was a defensive mechanism I used for many years to protect myself. But tonight, with your permission, I wish to speak directly to Abba. Abba, look what's happening here tonight. Look how many people have come to this hill where you fought. It is night once again, just like it was on June 5th. Darkness surrounds us here, but there is no fear. There are no sounds of war, no explosions, no gunfire. Tonight we celebrate you with melodies, with prayer and song. Tonight the only fire is in our memorial torch, which burns bright for you. Look how many people remember and appreciate what you achieved. You burn bright in our hearts. Abba guests have arrived from here from the United States. There is a military choir here, soldiers from the paratroopers, and even lone soldiers and their families, heroic young men and women who volunteer to step into harm's way so that we may be safe, to live in a, as free men and women in a country of our own. Look. Ima is here, and so are your granddaughters. Abba, 55 years have passed since you left me, left Ima, left us. I am no longer a baby. I have walked your path, 
and have tried to be worthy of it. Every day, Abba, I pass by the post and the adjacent bush, the exact spot your friends said you fell in the battle. But you must know that where you fought, the Israel of today, an ammunition hill heritage site are stronger than ever. And I'm here on your behalf, in your name. Abba, you must know that while I have no memory of our short time together, I know you deeply. And you have shaped so much of how I see the world. You taught me about family, fatherhood, and relationship. You taught me about community, duty, and responsibility. You are my teacher, my warrior. Abba, I know that you can never answer the questions of what you thought that night in that battle here on this hill. Whether you thought of me, but today, as a paratrooper officer myself, I'm convinced that even if I, it was in the back of your mind, Ima and I was there with you that night. And so Abba, I wanted to tell you, especially here, especially now, on this special evening and on this hill of yours, that I forgive you. I forgive you for not coming back. I forgive you with all my heart for choosing a country over your family that night. I forgive you because I know that you couldn't have done it any other way. I forgive you because I know that you believed with all your heart that you were facing, fighting for our lives and keeping us safe. And you ever tried. To those here tonight, the story of my father is simply one example, one story of all those we celebrate and honor here and forever. As we mark this Yom HaZikaron, my family and I know that we cannot bring my father back, nor can we return any of those whose names we remember together. And so I ask you to join me in a prayer for those who fell. May our lives and work and choices honor this extraordinary land we call home. May we be worthy of their legacy and preserve what is possible because of what they gave. May we all serve as vessels of peace. Vimru, amen. Sometimes in these moments, words fail us. It is why we have the power of music to touch our hearts and bring memory to life to turn our words of remembrance into melody of hope. Please welcome to the stage, Yonina. Oh, 
The next song is an uh, original song, which uh, we wrote, and uh, we want to dedicate it to uh, all the families of uh, the fallen soldiers. <laughs> Shabtem shetiu po bechelka shel malachim. Sikaron no shekla even erot ve degel bashvilim. Almoni haia bin chemo denot sair ve tami. Mina kravala basar al kanfene sharim adirim. המקום ינחם אתכם, בגן עדן תהיה מנוחתם. איך נפלו גיבורים על אדמתם, והשכול מוטבע בשנים. והעם הזה שלא ידע שלווה יושב איתכם שבעה, עומד ומיה, לוחש לו תודה. לא חשבתם שיגיע צעיר במאדי, שידברו ויספרו ויכתבו עליו שירים. ואותה תמונה מהראש של הר תלווה אתכם שנים. ועם הזמן כבר אין עוד מקום לקברים של נערים. המקום ינחם אתכם בגן עדן תהיה מנוחתה Thank <laughs> you. 
My name is Marianne Rockland. It is incredibly difficult to stand here before you and speak about my dear friend, Ilan, in the past tense. The pain of his loss is still fresh. It still feels surreal. How could it be? How could it be that such a young, beautiful, and so full of life young man is no longer here with us? Ilan was brutally murdered by Palestinian terrorists almost exactly two months ago on February 27th. Ilan was driving down Gvish Tishim, coming from a fun day hiking in the north with his younger brother Gabe, when his car was shot at near Beit Harava. Ilan was on his way to my wedding. Ilan was my brother Akiva's best friend. We all grew up together in West Hartford, Connecticut, and Ilan was like a part of our family. The last time I saw Ilan was this past December when I visited my brother and him in their shared apartment on the Upper West Side. I had asked Ilan if he would come to Israel for my wedding knowing he would surely want to, but thinking it probably wouldn't work out. Without hesitating, he said, of course. That was Ilan. He deeply loved his friends and his family and went above and beyond to be there for them. After high school, Ilan was accepted to a top university in America, but he chose to spend a gap year in Jerusalem. During this year, he developed a deep connection to the land of Israel and decided to make Aliyah. He wanted to serve in army intelligence, but he knew that he needed to improve his Hebrew, so he joined an ulpan program at Kibbutz De Eliyahu. He quickly became fluent in Hebrew, but due to a medical problem, was deemed ineligible for military service. But Ilan was determined, and he climbed through mountains of Israeli bureaucracy to adjust his medical profile and draft to the army. He succeeded and ended up joining MOFET, the Army Salary and Finance Department, as a computer programmer. This wasn't his first choice for a military job, and he had no idea how to code in Hebrew. But Ilan always made the best of whatever situation he was in. He quickly learned how to code, and in a short time was a top performer. He didn't complain, not once. Ilan was known for bringing people together. He would host what came to be his famous soup nights in his apartment in New York. It began as a fun activity with a close friend and quickly became a regular social gathering for many people. It combined two of Ilan's favorite things, friends and exploring the world. Each week, he'd pick a soup from a different country. After a few soup nights, Ilan started inviting his friends to partake as well. The more, the merrier. And as time went on, he op opened it up to anyone. Ilan treated everyone he met equally. He peppered them with questions about where they were from, what their purpose was in life, what their siblings' names were, and what their siblings' purpose was in life. And he would remember everything you'd say. Four months later, when you'd stumbled back into soup night, he'd follow up on the things you told him four months prior. He'd make you feel special. Elon was brilliant, but he was never arrogant. He only used his vast knowledge to help him further connect to people. It allowed him to find areas of mutual interest with almost any person he met. And he accepted every person for who they were with love and compassion. The terrible tragedy of Ilan's murder came amongst a horrific wave of terror attacks that began in January. 19 new victims of terror. Too many families and countless friends lost what is most dear to them. Why? Because of hatred and pure evil. These attacks hit us at a time of great national friction. We should all strive to emulate Ilan's beautiful qualities by having more love for one another, even for those who have different opinions and perspectives than our own. I would like to take a moment now to remember all the victims of terror who were murdered since January. Husband and wife, Eli Mizrahi, 48, and Natalie Mizrahi, 45, January 27th. Asher Natan, 14, January 27th. Rafael Ben Eliyahu, 56, January 27th. Ilya Sasansky, 26, January 27th. Shaul Chai, 68, January 27th. Irina Korolova, 60, January 27th. Alter Shlomo Liederman, 20, February 10th. Brothers Asher Menachem Pele, 8, and Yaakov Yisrael Pele, 6, February 10th. Staff S Sergeant Asil Suaid, 22, February 13th. Brothers Halel Yaniv, 21, and Yagel Yaniv, 19, February 26th. 
Ilan Ganellis, 26, February 27th. Ora Scar, 32, March 20th. Mother and daughters, Lucy D, 48, Maya D, 20, and Rina D, 15, April 7th. Alessandra Perini, 35, April 7th. May their memories be for a blessing. Ilan, we miss you, we love you, we still need you here with us. We will never forget you and we will do our best to continue in your righteous path. Your memory will forever be a blessing. We stand here on Ammunition Hill, the site of the fiercest battle in the battle for Jerusalem in 1967. A few hundred IDF paratroopers ran onto this hill and walked off, changing the face of history. They say the old city of Jerusalem and the battle for Jerusalem was the prize and Ammunition Hill was the price. The Wall of Honor at Ammunition Hill connects the global Jewish community. This ever-growing display of heroism honors Jewish servicemen and women who proudly served in defense of their countries across the world and throughout time. Each honoree is part of an elite legacy, immortalized by their loved ones at the site of one of the most influential battles in Jewish history. Together, we are creating an everlasting statement for all the world to see. It is on these grounds, at this battlefield, where we share the same past, the same values, the same hopes and goals. At this site, we made a 2,000-year-old dream come true, that the Jewish people reunite with Jerusalem. Built on the sacrifice and dedication of our Jewish heroes, Ammunition Hill personifies our collective resiliency. With each plaque placed on the wall, we reinforce the message that we are one people who have fought for freedom around the world. to the stage, Russell Robinson, Chief Executive Officer of Jewish National Fund, USA. Every life is precious and sacred. And tonight, we remember. For 75 years, we have celebrated the rebirth of the State of Israel on our ancestral soil. For all Jews, the rebirth was a miracle of biblical proportions. And today, we are blessed to contribute to Israel's miraculous journey, to serve as ambassadors, advocates, partners, benefactors, to bring Israel's story and struggle to life. We are only limited by our desires, efforts, and imagination. As we reflect, it is worth noting that many of us are here today who have only known in Israel as part of our existence. Yet some of are here today who knew a world without an Israel. Some of you have witnessed the rebirth of this extraordinary country, and some of us have experienced the ingathering of our Jewish people from corners throughout the earth. Yet most of us, most of us have only known a world where a Jew has had a place to call home. Many of us have done much more. We have taken an active role we have fought for the rebirth of the land of Israel for our Jewish people everywhere. Some fought for the battle of Jerusalem to become the unified capital. Many gave, their hard, gave more than hard work and money, sweat and tears. They gave their lives. Tonight, we remember them. We pay tribute to their memory. 
And we are inspired because we have an opportunity to continue carrying the torch, fulfilling the dreams of our Jewish people, to serve as a light upon nations and to continue turning dreams into a reality. That is our commitment tonight, tomorrow and forever. Too many times we equate heroes with Superman or Wonder Woman or Batman. Yet such imagery fails to capture the reality that we are just ordinary people, ordinary adults, ordinary teenagers who have been chosen, yes, chosen to be heroes, heroes to make the world a better place. We help people who we've never met, heroes who we never allow anyone or anything to stand in our way when we are presented with an opportunity to protect the land, defend the people of Israel, and support the Jewish people everywhere. As individuals, we are strong, yet together we're invisible and can overcome anything. In 2023, we stand here and we know that good does triumph over evil. Tonight, we remember the ordinary people who fought and gave their lives to establish the state of Israel for all of us. They gave their lives so Jews from Yemen could come as free Jews to the state of Israel. They gave their lives so the Jews from the ashes of the Holocaust had a place to call home. And Jews from Iraq and Morocco, America, Ethiopia, Russia, and today, Jews from Ukraine could come and be safe and secure. And we commit tonight and every day that we'll continue this Zionist partnership with strength and with pride. Today, we're challenged like never before because we must build a new bridge of our one people for the people of Israel America, Buenos Aires, Paris, Beersheba, and around the world, we must foster a new conversation. A conversation about our shared values and our common destiny. We owe such dialogue to those we honor tonight. We must make the experience of coming to Israel the rite of passage like our must high school students who are here tonight. Every Jewish teenager must make it part of their life cycle to walk the land, love the land, remember the heroes, and meet the ordinary people, the heroes who make up the people of Israel. Let us make it a promise to keep the flame burning bright for our generations of tomorrow. That is our responsibility. That is our privilege. That is our, do our honor. An hour before the opening session of the First Zionist Congress in 1887, Herzl asked his aide, David Wolfson, to create a banner for the hall's entrance. Wolfson never had no idea where he would find such a thing. He ran through the boulevards and the streets. He scoured shops. He tried to find something. And when exhausted, he went into a synagogue just to rest for a moment. And there... There, he saw the banner that he had to have. He took a blue and white talit. He removed the fringes. With a fountain pen, he inscribed the Star of David in the center. Thus, Israel's flag was born. This beloved country, a country whose flag is made of a talit, whose anthem is the prayer of hope, not just for us, but for our children and our children's children and our generations yet unborn. Join us now to share with us a defining piece of music that has come to encapsulate our aspirations for peace. Am Yisrael Chai, the people of Israel shall live. Please honor the Israel Defense Choir.
עוד יש מפרס לבן באופק מול עולם שחור כבד כל שנבקש לו יהי ואם בחלונות האלה אור נרות החג רועד כל שנבקש לו יהי הנושא עומד בדלת, תן מילה טובה בפי, כל שנבקש לו יהי. ואם נפשך רוצה ללכת, כל שנבקש לו יהי. לו יהי, לו יהי. כל שופר וכל תופים, כל שמבקש לו יהי. לו תישמע בתוך כל אלה, גם תפילה אחת מפי, כל שמבקש לו יהי. לו יהי, לו יהי, אנא לו יהי. כל שנבקש לו יהי, לו יהי, לו יהי, אנא לו יהי, כל שנבקש לו יהי. ואם פתאום יפעל האור, כל שנבקש ותן שלווה ותן גם כוח לכל אלה שנוער כל שנבקש לו יהי לו יהי לו יהי אנא לו יהי כל שנבקש לו Please welcome Amichai Shikli, Minister of Diaspora Affairs. Alon Wald, Hara Wasserman, מחת הצנחנים יואב ברונר, לוטנט קולונל עודד זימן, the incoming commander of the 55th paratroopers reserve brigade, my friend רוסל רובינסון, chief executive officer of the Jewish national fund USA and his wife מרסי, דוקטור סול, ליזל בראון, president of Jewish national fund USA and co-chair of this mission and his wife לורן, מישל ברנשטיין, co-chair of this mission, Chairman of Board of the Base, Richard Corman and his wife Jean, dear members of Brieve families, Mishpachot Shakulot, lone soldiers from around the world, Jewish war veterans and guests from near and far, ladies and gentlemen. 6,000 people 
marched to the streets of Vienna, escorting his coffin. These words describe the final farewell to Theodor Herzl, the father of political Zionism. In his will, Herzl asked to be buried alongside his father in a metal coffin. Until the day, the people of Israel move my bones to the land of Israel. He requested a simple funeral without flowers or speeches. Yet his assistant, David Wolfson, delivered a short prophetic eulogy. Herzl's name, he said, will be forever sanctified and remembered as long as one Jew remain on earth. At this difficult hour, we remember your eternal oath from the Sixth Zionist Congress, and we too take that same oath. Im eshkachech Yerushalayim, tishakach yemini. Forty-four years later, only three years after the Holocaust, Israeli troops stood at Sharagai, the gate of our eternal city of Jerusalem, during Israel's War of Independence. During that war, some 2,000 soldiers, one third of all those killed, fell in the fight for Jerusalem and its surroundings. Yet despite that terrible sacrifice, the city remained divided. The Jewish quarter was in fact the largest community destroyed. The forced, the forced departure from the city is described in the book, Jerusalem, O Jerusalem. Two by two, the 1,700 residents of the Jewish quarter set out the 500 meter route that separates Zion Gate from the new city. Upon the departure, nearly 2,000 years of continuous Jewish presence in the old city came to an end. 19 years later, on June 5, 1967, the 55th Paratroopers Brigade Command Group gathered outside the house in Jerusalem, Beta Kerem neighborhood in the southern part of the city to plan the operation to liberate the city. At a certain moment, an elderly woman approached them and handed them an Israeli flag. As Yoram Zamosh, one of the young company commanders remembered, she tucked the flag in his vest and said, this has been our flag since we were exiled from our home in the old city in 1948. I want you to know that the entire Jewish people is pushing and urging you forward, waiting for you to wave this flag over our eternal capital. Decades later, Yoram said, to this day, I can still feel that old woman tears running down the back of my neck. The next day, June 6, on one of the hardest battles in Jerusalem that ever known, took place on, the, on this hill where about 100 brave young soldiers faced fortified bunkers in the battle of Givata Tachmoshet. 36 warriors lost their lives in that battle, including Eitan Naveh, who did not hesitate for even a moment, and at his commander's request, climbed out of the trench to provide cover for his commanders. The next day, after intense battle raged through the neighborhoods of East Jerusalem, the thrilling words, Arabait Be'adenu, the Temple Mount is in our hands, echoed across the city like a shofar. The warriors fulfilled the old woman's request and hoisted their flag above Temple Mount, saying, we felt we were not defeating the Jordanian leg legionnaires, but the Roman legionnaires of Titus. Three weeks after the liberation of the city, IDF Chief of Staff Yitzhak Rabin delivered an unforgettable speech, which he concluded with his following words. The source of the power of our warrior was not the weapons they carried, but their awareness of their historic mission, the recognition of the justice of their cause, and their deep love to our homeland, based on the realization that the people of Israel have the right to live their lives in their own country, in their own state, free, independent, and in peace. Today, just as then, we are required to stand up, risk our lives, and fight to continue to fulfill the dreams of our ancestors, 
alongside the thousands of brave men and women who fought and died to defend our right to live in this land, our 13 brave young Jewish soldiers who left their comfortable homes and lives overseas to join the Israeli army and fight for their land, country, and people. Daniel Haas and Avraham Shmuel Grogan killed in 1982 in the first Lebanon war. Alex Zinger killed in 1987 in the Lebanon border. Michael Levin and Jonas Darviv killed in 2006 in the second Lebanon war. Yosef Partu killed in 2012 by rockets fired from Gaza. Jordan Ben Simon, Sean Carmeli and Max Steinberg killed in 2014 in Operation Protective Edge, Tsukaitan. Shlomo Ridenow died in 2016. Yosef Cohen killed in a terrorist attack in Benjamin in 2018. Eli Kay killed in the old city of Jerusalem a year and a half ago. And just recently, we were mentioned here before, Elan Ganeles, who was killed earlier this year in a terror attack in the Jordan Valley. Their sacrifice will never be forgotten. The 13 young heroes signify the unbreakable and eternal bond between the Jewish state and the Jewish people. Yehi zichram baruch, leman Sion lo echeshe, ulemaan Yerushalayim lo eshkot. This evening, we do not just recall the memory of those who have fought and fallen for the sake of the past. We do it for the future. We do it to connect those who came before us with those who carry the torch forward. To that end, we are now joined by the following decorated IDF veterans and their children and grandchildren. Staff Sergeant Moshe Orbach served as part of the 55th Paratrooper Brigade and fought on this very site in 1967 and in other wars and campaigns. By his side is his grandson, Private Achinoam Orbach, who currently serves in the Israeli Air Force. Together we honor Erez Orbach, Zichro Livracha, Achinoam's brother, son of Ori and Karen, who was killed six years ago in a terrorist attack. Major Yaki Chetz, fought in the Ammunition Hill Battle as a paratrooper in the 55th Brigade and received the Medal of Valor for his bravery. Major Hates was also cited for his gallantry in face of enemy fire during the Yom Kippur War and subsequently received the Israeli Defense Prize for his work with Rafael Defense Systems. By his side is his grandson, Major Tamir Hates, who is a platoon commander in Bad Echad, the Israeli Army Officers Academy. Together they honor the 66th Battalion, Comrade in Arms, who fell in, during the Sixth Day and Yom Kippur Wars. Lieutenant Itzik Schechter fought in the Battle of Ammunition Hill as a paratrooper of the 55th Brigade. By his side is his son, Lieutenant Colonel Menachem Schechter, and his granddaughter, Sergeant Ofek Schechter, who serves in the IDF Jordan Valley Brigade. Together, we honor Isaac's son, Lieutenant Ishai Schechter, Zichol Livracha, Menachem's brother and Ofek uncle, Ofek's uncle, who fell in Lebanon in 1996. First Sergeant Yossi Ben Gigi fought in Jerusalem during the Six Day War as a tank commander of the secret tank platoon of the Jerusalem Brigade. Yossi commanded one of the two tanks that took part in the Battle of Ammunition Hill. As the Battle for Jerusalem raged in 1967, it was the first Sergeant Ben Gigi's tank that blasted open the Lion's Gate of the old city, paving the way for the reunification of Jerusalem. By his side is his grandson, Staff Sergeant Ido Gal, a paratrooper of the 890 Battalion of the 31st Brigade. Together we honor the fallen soldiers of the Jerusalem and the Harel Brigades. Lieutenant Colonel Yehuda Cohen also fought in the Battle of Ammunition Hill as a paratrooper of the 55th Brigade. During his military service, Yehuda received the Israel Defense Prize, as well as the special commendation for the IDF Chief of Staff for intelligence work that remains a closely guarded secret. By his side are his grandsons, 
Sergeant Avishai Cohen, a paratrooper who served in the Special Reconnaissance Unit of the Paratroopers, Sayeret Sanchanim, and Corporal Itamar Zerem, a combat medic instructor. Together we honor the fallen soldiers from units whose actions and deeds remain classified. Second Lieutenant Ginat Goldring Wald served in the Medical Corps of the IDF. She is the widow of Rami Wald, Zicholi Vracha, my mother, an extraordinary grandmother to 11 grandchildren. By her side is her grandson, my nephew, first Staff Sergeant Itai Gazit, an IDF soldier with special needs who proudly volunteered to serve his country as an equal among his peers. Together we honor the brave widows and the widows of, of the IDF who carry the legacy of the fallen and who inspire us in countless ways. And now please welcome back Yonina.
My name is Richard Corman. I'm the chairman of the board of the Michael Levin Base. I'm sure that I represent the sentiments of the 1,500 people present this evening, as well as the countless number of people that are watching this live stream worldwide in acknowledging and expressing our appreciation to the organizations that made this very memorable evening possible. Ammunition the Hill, Alone Wald, the Jewish National Fund, the Michael Levin Lone Soldier Foundation in the United States, the Aviv Foundation, and the Michael Levin Base. And a big shout out to the Jewish war veterans who came from America to be with us this evening. There's a profound message in the Torah with regards to Shabbat. Two distinct words, shamor v'zachor, to guard and to remember. And yet we learn that despite the fact that these two words are so different, they are intertwined. Shamor v'zachor b'dibur echad. It's as if we say both words as one. This evening, for Yom HaZikaron, we remember. We remember those that lost their lives defending the state of Israel. We remember those Israeli citizens and tourists who were brutally murdered by terrorism. But we also shamor, we also guard, we preserve their dreams, we preserve their vision of a brighter tomorrow. And that's why I am so proud to say that the board and the staff of the Michael Levin base are preserving the dream and the vision of Michael. Michael always had the dream that Chayalim Bodedim, lone soldiers, and lone Benot Sherut, women who do national service, would have a home away from home, would be assisted, and would be provided with the sustenance that they needed to do the courageous things as they serve the state of Israel. In the three short years that we've carried Michael's name, we are so proud now to serve more than 1,800 young men and women who serve the state of Israel. May we continue to carry Michael's vision for many, many years to come. Kain Yehiratzon. I defend the state of Israel because Israel is my home. Israel is my home. Israel is my home. I defend the state of Israel because Israel is my birthright. Israel is my birthright. Never again will Jews be afraid. Never again will Jews live in fear. Every Jew is responsible for one another. I defend the state of Israel for my family and myself. I defend the state of Israel for the children of today. The survivor of yesterday. The next generation and every generation after. 
those who did not have the ability to defend it. ceremony when he received his red beret and became a proud member of the 890 paratroop brigade my wife Harriet and I were sitting right over here in these bleachers watching the events transpire listening to the national anthem Hatikva being blasted through the loudspeakers as dozens of large Israeli flags wave briskly in the wind. It was truly a sight to behold, and according to my son, it was the proudest moment of his young life. Good evening, everyone. My name is Mark Levin. <clears throat> I am Michael's father of blessed memory, and it is with both reverence and pride that I stand before you this evening, the father of a remarkable young man who gave all that he had to defend the nation that he loved so dearly. Michael's journey was a long and arduous one. It began in the suburbs of Philadelphia, where he grew up with his two sisters, Alisa and Dara, in a conservative Zionist home. He was a proud grandson who was inspired by the courage of his two grandfathers, my dad, a decorated combat veteran of the Second World War, and my father-in-law, a Polish Holocaust survivor who spent 26 torturous months in Auschwitz. He and Michael were very close. As a young man, Michael was very proud of his Judaism, his heritage, and especially the nation of Israel so much so that he felt compelled to answer to a higher calling and follow his dream by making Aliyah and serving in the IDF. He also had aspirations of becoming a career officer. At the end of his second year in service, Michael happened to be home on leave just as the Second Lebanon War broke out. I can still vividly remember him sleeping on the floor in front of the TV for two days straight. He anxiously watched the war erupt on CNN. And like a caged animal, he paced up and down the room, back and forth, over and over again. With a cell phone glued to his ear, he desperately tried to reach his friends and commanding officers in Israel. Having no success, 
he informed us that he just couldn't stay home any longer, that he had to return to Israel. This, despite the fact, despite the fact that Michael had the same dream, the same reoccurring dream, week after week, month after month, for two years, a dream that he would be killed in combat. Of course, Harriet and I knew nothing of these faithful premonitions, only finding out about them two months after Michael's passing. Well, soon Harriet and I, along with Michael's two sisters, found ourselves hugging and kissing Michael goodbye in front of the El Al Departure Lounge at JFK Airport in New York. It turned out to be the last time we would ever see him. When he returned to Israel, he was told to either stay where he was or go to Hebron for guard duty. Michael's unit had already been briefed and was on its way to northern Israel for a possible ground incursion into Lebanon. To no one's surprise, Michael disobeyed orders and took off north, traveling any way he could, getting any ride he possibly could, eventually discovering the whereabouts of his unit. Upon seeing him, his commanding officer refused to allow him to join his squad without permission or the appropriate orders. According to eyewitnesses, a long and heated argument ensued between Michael and his commanding officer until finally his commander threw up his arms in frustration and said, fine, do what you want to do, Michael. Michael was now exactly where he wanted to be, doing exactly what he was trained to do, defend Israel with every fiber of his being. This was his moment. Out of the 121 IDF casualties, fatalities, in the Second Lebanon War, Michael was the first paratrooper and the only American to fall in that conflict. As per his wishes, he was laid to rest at the military cemetery Har Herzl on Tisha B'Av, the 9th of Av. His funeral was attended by thousands. <clears throat> Aside from being a passionate Zionist who spent his first two nights in Israel sleeping on a park bench and then broke into the IDF's enlistment office by climbing through an open window on the second floor to get into the army, Michael was also a dreamer and a visionary. He was inspired by the words of a famous American, Robert Kennedy, President Kennedy's brother, who was often quoted as saying, some people see things that are and ask why. I dream of things that never were and ask why not. This was Michael. Serving as a lone soldier, someone with no immediate family in Israel, he was hampered, as all lone soldiers are, with a series of problems, challenges, and obstacles that native-born Israelis do not have to contend with. He would often share these with us during our weekly conversation calls. As a result, he approached a dear friend of his and a mentor, suggesting that when he finished the service, that together it would create a lone, a national lone soldier organization, a center, a place that was solely dedicated to the unique needs of the thousands of lone soldiers serving in the IDF. At that time, no such organization existed. I'm proud to say that today there are multiple organizations and facilities that do just that. The most recent 
is the Michael Levin Bass, our co-host for tonight, a dynamic, vibrant, and highly effective organization that is transforming the lives of Israel's lone soldiers. In America, we created the Michael Levin Lone Soldier Foundation, which financially supports several of these organizations. Because of the tireless efforts of hundreds of dedicated, committed, and talented people who make it their life's mission to improve the lives of lone soldiers, Michael's dream has become a reality. Where once the term lone soldier was relatively unknown and a little understood concept, today I'm proud to say that things have changed and they've changed for the better. For today, there is a new awareness, understanding, and most important, a new appreciation for lone soldiers and the vital contribution they're making to the IDF. This was Michael's legacy. But today isn't just about Michael or lone soldiers. It's about the victims of terror and the thousands upon thousands of brave young men and women who for 75 years fought, bled, and died to keep this nation safe. Without hesitation, they heeded the call to arms when this country was in peril and needed them the most. And so, as we begin this solemn day of Yom HaZikaron, let us all be comforted by the fact that the spirit of Zionism and the love of this country are both alive and well, for they live in the hearts, minds, and souls of the brave young men and women who have sworn to defend it with their lives. And finally, it has been said that when a man dies, he dies with but three possessions, his heart, his soul, and his spirit. His heart, well, that stays with him. His soul returns to God. But his spirit his spirit continues to live on in the memories of those he left behind. Therefore, it is incumbent upon us, all of us, on this sacred day to remember, to honor the ultimate sacrifice that our loved ones made for this nation. For by doing so, their spirit will continue to shine bright and they will never, ever be forgotten. Thank you. I'm 
for the next song from Tilly. Shira Mad.
please rise. As this program comes to a close, thank you for being here this evening. Thank you to all those who joined me on stage to make this special somber moment. And thank you to the brave men and women who stand as Israel's only line of defense against so many who wish for us to be relegated to the pages of a history book. On this Yom HaZikaron, we look back to the past, to those whose lives were cut short, those who gave everything. We seek inspiration from their memories, the way they lived, the love they gave, the sacrifice they made. But we do not reflect on the past simply for the sake of memory. We do it for the future, to remind ourselves that freedom is not free. We do it to remind ourselves that the heroism we celebrate tonight is alive and well inside each of us. We commemorate the past to give us the strength for our future, for our people we love, for a country that is home. On this Yom HaZikaron, may we all find peace in the memory of those who came before us and the power to make their lives and our lives a blessing. Thank you so much. שם בהרים שמעל הכפר שלנו יש שם גן של שושנים מחר אצלי יש כן בבוקר עם ציוץ 